Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. Today once again in the collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update after a, um, a little interruption uh, because of personal circumstances we couldn't come together for quite some time. And today we have finally the opportunity to finish chapter 4 in Lorraine Bettner's book Roman Catholicism with point number 10 of the tradition. And after that, we are going on to something else. And Tom and I just had a very interesting discussion before the recording about um, our future studies. And I think that will be very interesting what we have um, cooked up for the future. But actually, we haven't cooked up anything. It is the Holy Spirit that just leads us into doing things that we maybe never thought we'd do. But, you know, everybody has to grow. Um, we at least have to grow. We have to grow in our faith. We have to grow in understanding. And we have to grow in wisdom. And wisdom comes by the reading of the Word of God, the Bible. And very often... I at least can accuse myself of that. I am too lazy to read the book myself, just listen to other people reading it and then explaining it, and then by that being led by my nose <laughs> from one lie into the next deception. That has been very often the case in the past, and I'm sick of it. And the only reason or the only thing that I can do against it is just picking up the Bible, read it for myself, word for word, and try to understand it with the hope and with the praying of the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom and understanding. And uh, with that, we, both Tom and I, discovered a few things that are very important to be rectified in future uh, broadcasts of ours, future studies of us, because there are many things that, <clears throat> as well as I, also Tom, took because we read this from other people and had by that a completely false understanding. And the Bible and the Holy Spirit, our Father in Heaven, now finally corrected us. I hope in time that we are not too old yet, <laughs> that we will be given the time to rectify the mistakes. But I can tell you the upcoming studies are very, very interesting. It's not directly for tomorrow. Be very sure of that. We have to take our time and make sure that everything is okay. But it is a study of wonderful Protestant authors from centuries ago and from the writers of the Bible even more centuries ago, by people led by the Holy Spirit of God, who told them what to write and for us to read and to understand. With that little introduction, let me please allow you to introduce Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom, and welcome to the broadcast today. Hello, Jörg. It's nice to be here and uh, to continue our discussion after such a long break. But... Uh, we we'll recap the listeners. We're talking about uh, uh, Lorraine Bettner's book, and particularly the ch the chapter entitled "Tradition," and we're talking about how Roman Catholic tradition in the Roman Catholic Church replaces the Bible. That the Bible literally becomes an obstacle in the Roman Catholic Church, and it must be uh, minimized or done away with altogether, so that Roman Catholic tradition can rule and reign. Okay, Roman Catholicism is a man-made religion, and the Bible is an obstacle to that to that man-made religion. So the Roman Catholic Church's subtle attempt is to minimize the Bible to eventually eliminate it and replace it with Roman Catholic tradition. The Protestants, on the other hand, uh, their faith is dictated by the Scriptures, the Word of God. We hold it as the very words of God, not to be added to, not to be taken away, to be obeyed, to be taught to our children, to be lived and practiced with the great hope that we serve the living God by obeying the scriptures. Our, our entire faith is, is given to us by the scriptures. And without the scriptures, we have no faith. 
Okay, the Bible says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, how do you raise up a child in the way he should go, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, without the scriptures? Okay, so a Roman Catholic cannot raise his child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord by minimizing the scriptures or taking them out of his possession entirely. That's the difference between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. The Bible is our entire source of, of faith and practice. It's our rule book of life. It's our saving grace. It's, it's God in the flesh to us. And when it speaks, God speaks. And that's the importance that we give it. That's the importance we hold of it. Now, we're going to talk about how uh, the interpretation of the Bible becomes the great bugaboo of the Roman Catholic Church. With that, I'll turn it back to Yerk. Thank you, Tom. That was a very interesting uh, inauguration of uh, today's broadcast you gave. So, as I said, we go into point 10, interpreting the Bible after all the other nine points that we have already read in this wonderful tradition. And I, um, when we are done with this, have a picture or two that I want to share with you and uh, show you um, how even Roman Catholics sometimes admit that the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church measured at the Bible, has nothing to do with each other. But before we go into this last point 10 of Lorraine Bettner's wonderful book, Roman Catholicism, where he says, while the Roman Catholic people in the United States of America have access to the Bible, they are told that they cannot understand it and that it must be interpreted for them by the church speaking through the priest. People ordinarily do not waste their time reading a book that they are persuaded they cannot understand. The priests, in turn, are pledged not to interpret the Bible for themselves, but only as the Church interprets it, and according to, quote, the anonymous consent of the fathers, unquote. <laughs> that there is no such thing as anonymous consent of the fathers. I don't know if we spoke about this in this series, but I know that Tom spoke about that in the past when I'm listening to his recordings in the year 2011 and 2012 and again and again and again showing how people like Augustine and uh, Jerome and even a few other of the quote-unquote fathers of the Roman Catholic Church always contradicted itself and never had the same belief system. But the Church, the author continues, says, has never issued an official commentary giving that interpretation. And as we have pointed out earlier, the anonymous consent of the Fathers is purely a myth. Yeah, it was in this book then. <laughs> For there is scarcely a point of doctrine on which they do not differ. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, for instance, was denied by Anselm, Buenaventura and Thomas Aquinas, three of the greatest Roman theologians. Yet Rome presumes to teach that Mary was born without sin, and that is the anonymous teaching of the fathers. In their insistence on following an official interpretation, Roman Catholics are pursuing a course similar to that of the Christian scientists, who also have the Bible, but insist that it must be interpreted by Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health, with key to, script, to the scriptures, and that of the Mormons, who likewise have the Bible, but interpret it by the Book of Mormon. The practical result of the priests and, and people being told that they cannot interpret the Bible for themselves is that they read it but very little. Why should they? They cannot understand it. They may read a few pages here and there, but even among the priests there is scarcely one in twenty who reads it from beginning to end and really studies it. Instead, the priests spend hours 
reading the breviaries, books of daily devotions and prayers as required by their church, but which are of human origin, not divine as the word of God. This practice of representing the Bible as a mysterious book is a part of Rome's overall program of presenting Christianity as a mystery religion, in which the Mass in particular, as well as various other practices, are set forth as mysteries which are not to be understood, but which are to be accepted with implicit faith. The priests and the people alike look upon the Bible as a mysterious book. And anyway, the interpretation is given to them in Pope's decrees and Church Council pronouncements, which are declared to be clearer and more easily understood. Furthermore, these letter supersede Scripture. Experience proves that whenever an interpretation becomes more important than a document, the document becomes buried and the interpretation alone survives. For this reason, the average Roman Catholic is faithful to his church, but neglects his Bible. Instead of following the teachings of God, the priests and people follow the traditions of men. A fraudulent claim recently put forth by the Knights of Columbus in a series of newspaper and magazines, magazine ads designed to appeal to Protestants and others is that the Roman Catholic Church produced the Bible and that we received it from her. Some of her spokesmen attempt to say that the canon of the Bible was established in the 4th century by the Pope and Council of Carthage in AD 397. But that statement is erroneous on two counts. In the first place, there was no Pope as such in AD 397. It was not until the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that the Bishop of Rome was designated Pope and the authority of the Bishop of Rome never has been acknowledged by the Eastern Churches. Previous to that time, all priests and bishops were called Popes, the Latin word Papa. And in the Eastern Churches, that title is applied to ordinary priests even to the present day. The Council of Chalcedon attempted to restrict the title exclusively to the Bishop of Rome, who at that time was Leo I, and conferred it posthumously on all previous bishops of Rome in order to make it appear that an unbroken succession of popes had proceeded from the Apostle Peter. And in the second place, the New Testament was produced during the first century of the Christian era and had assumed its present form centuries before the Roman Catholic Church developed its distinctive characteristics. At that time, the Eastern Churches were dominant in Christian affairs and the church in Rome was relatively insignificant. Gregory I, called Gregory the Great, who was consecrated Pope in 590 and died in 604, was in effect the founder of the papal system. He reorganized the church, revised the ritual, restored monastic discipline, attempted to enforce celibacy among the clergy, and extended the authority of the Roman Church into many countries adjacent to Italy. He, more than anyone else, gave the Roman Church its distinctive form and set the course that it was to follow in its later history. And before I continue reading, let me just tell you, Pope Gregory I, or Gregory the Great, is someone that I and even Tom studied a little bit deeper than what just Lorraine Bettner says here in this part of the book, because Pope Gregory, in his letters to uh, Emperor Maurice, stated that that bishop who claims to be bishop of bishops, or calls himself the universal bishop, is the forerunner of Antichrist. That is what he wrote in personal letters in the 1590s to Emperor Maurice, 
who then later got killed by his predecessor, Emperor Phocas. And Emperor Phocas was the one who gave the um, spiritual authority of the Eastern and the Western Church to the Pope of Rome. So Gregory the First is someone I advise everybody to study a little bit deeper. It's very, very interesting. And you can get his letters, by the way, on the internet if you do a little research. I got them, and it's very interesting to read a little bit on those. Now, in other words, it was the Emperor Focus who gave the title Bishop of Bishops to the Bishop of Rome, and he be, literally, <clears throat> by his own mouth, became the Antichrist, right? Yeah, that is something that Martin Luther wrote in his book, um, about uh, uh, the papacy and institution of the devil. That's right. You remember, we both read that book. So um, that is what uh, the studies uh, of that uh, of true history actually revealed. And even Gregory the Great was the one who warned before that, that the bishop who calls himself the universal bishop is the forerunner of Antichrist. <laughs> Then just Condemned focus. By his own mouth. Yeah, focus. Who killed Maurice and came in the seat afterward did exactly that and gave that title to the Bishop of Rome. Yeah, ever since. I think that was in 606 after Gregory the Great died. In 606, if I'm not mistaken. The author continues Furthermore, long before the Council of Carthage, the particular books now found in the New Testament, and only those, had come to be looked upon by the Church at large as the inspired and infallible Word of God on the basis of their genuineness and, uh, and authority. These particular writings, in distinction from all other books of that age, manifest within themselves this genuineness and authority as we read them. And the Council of Carthage did not so much choose the books that were to be accepted in the New Testament, but rather placed its stamp of approval on the selection that by that time, under the providential control of the Holy Spirit, had come to be looked upon by the Church as the New Testament canon. The Old Testament canon was completed and had assumed its present form long before the coming of Christ. The Roman Church, of course, had nothing whatever to do with that. And here is chapter 4, Tradition Ending, and chapter 5, Peter Starting. And I can assure you that is an at least as interesting chapter as the one we just read. And that goes for the whole book. And Tom can surely confirm that because uh, Tom read the whole book. And this is why I came to the idea of let's read it together. So, Tom, I would very, very much like to hear if you have some conclusion on this chapter four of tradition of Lorraine Bettner's book, Roman Catholicism, that you have before we continue in our next little study of Samuel C. Gibbs' book, uh, An Understandable History of the Bible. Yes, I, I have a closing comment about this. I find it very uh, ironic that the Roman Catholic Church spends its entire career trying to downplay the Bible, to change the Bible, to forbid people to read the Bible, to corrupt the Bible, and uh, to make it a mystery that a human being cannot understand. And yet, at the same time, it takes credit for giving the world the Bible. Does anybody see the irony in that? I've got another question. If Rome is so boastfully and proudly and arrogantly and ridiculously stands before the world and takes credit to itself for giving us the scripture, who gave Jesus the scripture? Who gave Abraham the scripture? Who is the dispenser of the word of God but God himself? And I'm here to tell you, the Pope and all of his successors are not God, nor are they the vicar of God, but the Antichrist himself. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. 
you are absolutely correct with everything you said. And as I already announced, I have a few pictures that I want to share with you. Oh, <laughs> two pictures actually it is. One is taken from a video um, that was called Antichrist Pope Francis. Uh, and the picture that I took here from the people who made this video is uh, worldslastchance.com. It is not a channel that I can absolutely advise to watch, but it has, like many others, some truths and some mistakes. But this picture I just loved. Grace by tradition. That is Roman Catholic policy. And what does the Bible say? That grace is a free gift of God to anyone who reaches out and wants to have it. Grace by faith. And faith comes by reading and understanding the Word of God. So when you forbid people to read the Word of God, you are restricting them of having grace. Therefore, you have to find another way to give grace to the people. You give grace by tradition. You give grace by indulgences. That is what the Roman Catholic Church stands for. And I think this picture makes that quite clear. Do you have any comment on this picture, Tom? No, oh, it's certainly, uh, we, know, we, we know as Bible-believing Christians, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The word tradition isn't included at all in that. Right. And, uh, so uh, that's the difference between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. We give the credit where the credit is due, and it's due only to the Creator. God himself, the author and the finisher of our, of our faith, the, and the author of the scriptures, and uh, uh, he is all in all. He doesn't need a pope, and he doesn't need a church. So uh, we are to be, a, be corrected, especially in this ecumenical age where everything is called Christianity and none of it is true. Back to you, York. Oh, yeah, this ecumenical age. Tom, you just give me there a wonderful stop word. Um, you were speaking about um, the... Um, joint doctrine of justification. The Roman Catholic Church signed with the Lutheran Worldwide Federation on the 31st of October 1999. Let me just see if I can pick up the picture. You and I, we did a few broadcasts analyzing the, pic the paper. Here it is. Analyzing the paper that Richard Bennett wrote on in, in that regard. You remember probably that was yes, I do. that were the very first recordings you and I did together in 2015. Um, and you mentioned, of course, this. Oh, how do you say it? I? It, it actually is an awful abomination to choose the 31st of October in 2000 uh, in 1999. Um, when the 31st of October in 1517 stands for the beginning of the Reformation under Martin Luther. And then, of course, in 1999, they ended the Reformation by signing this damnable paper. And you made a very good point of that date. Uh, I think it's wonderful. It just needs to be mentioned here in, in this broadcast. But there's also something else that even I didn't fall about, and, and I, I just fell over it when you when you said that in your um, reading, and you were doing that in the reading of uh, Cold War Babylon 2. The Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well, again, a wonderful book that I can advise everybody to read. <laughs> I'm just uploading these on uh, my Joggler's War on this info channel, all the readings of Tom in 2012 of that, and I can assure you, you should not miss those. Anyway, the second point next to the date, the 31st of October 1999, when the Roman, uh, when the Lutheran Worldwide Federation signed the uh, capitulation to the Roman Catholic Church, it was signed in 
Augsburg, a German city that maybe doesn't say many, uh, doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't give you any idea what's it all about, but Augsburg was the city where in 1555 the treaty was signed that the Protestant rulers of Germany had the right that the peoples of their jurisdiction could adhere to the faith of the rulers. Not Roman Catholic, but Protestant faith. That was the Treaty of Augsburg 1555. A very, very important city to sign this. So you have two damnable points about this contract. The Lutheran Church signed with the Roman Catholic Church. First and for all, the date, 31st of October, which is recognized as the beginning of the Reformation in 1517, with Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses uh, allegedly to the church door. That is not historically proven. What historically is proven is that he published those papers on the 31st of October. Maybe he nailed them to the church door, maybe he didn't, but he published them. That is historically verifiable. And the second one is that in Augsburg, in 1555, so some 40 years after the beginning of the Reformation, the German dukes and lords and everything, the rulers in the time, because you didn't have Germany like you have today, there were all different dukedoms and, and, and you know, there wasn't a federal <laughs> government as there was today. They were all little splintered ones. And they had, with the Roman Catholic Church, finally the quote-unquote agreement that the people could practice their Protestant faith in Augsburg and in that same city the Lutheran Church capitulated again. Now I don't know Tom if you were um, aware of these facts of the city of Augsburg. You didn't mention it in the reading of the book of uh, uh, P.D. Stewart, his second part, but I know it because I'm German and I studied this a little bit and I know uh, it's at Augsburg. I never stumbled upon that fact, even not years ago when we did this recording together. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm not a student of European history, and so I'm not an expert on the subject. I don't, I don't try, try not to delve into areas that I'm not qualified to speak. Uh, but I am a student of church history and a very new student by, by a perfect standard. And, but, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more geared toward understanding the role of the Roman Catholic Church as opposed to biblical Christianity. And uh, it's not surprising at all to me to find out that this signing took place in Augsburg when it had so much Protestant significance prior to that. It's just Rome's strategic uh, tearing down the wall of Protestantism. Look, we, we know that the Council of Trent was convened to destroy the Protestant Reformation. This is just part of that process. This photograph that you're seeing is the destruction of Protestantism with the cooperation of this supposed representation, this supposed representative of, of the Presbyterian, or rather the uh, Martin Luther Church. And uh, it, it's all meant to speak volumes to those who... Uh, are Roman Catholic and dedicated to the destruction of Protestantism. This is for their edification. This is for their uh, uh, strength and purpose. This is for the destruction of Protestantism and, and the, uh, the sole authority of the Roman Catholic Church over Christianity. That's what you're seeing in this photograph. And they, they strategically uh, picked the Lutheran Church to do this too. They particularly chose the location on which to do this. They particularly chose the date on which to do this, all of which to signify the defeat of Protestantism. It all speaks volumes in the defeat of Protestantism. And another point what? that you made during the reading of, uh, of um, P. 
P.D. Stewart's book is that the Lutheran uh, bishop, Dr. Christian Krause, the one who is dressed in, uh, on the left-hand side in black, is dressed in black, and the Roman Catholic Cardinal Cassidy, Edward Idris Cassidy, dressed in red and white, is dressed in superior colors because black is a color of submission. That's right. That's another point that you made. So we have three, at least. <laughs> Maybe we come up with more the well, more we analyze this. Like, but. Just suffice it to say that there's layer upon layer upon layer. Like an onion, to, yeah. To everything that's taking place in this photograph. Yeah. Probably so, take all day to describe all the significances. <laughs> yeah, but interesting. Huh? You have the date, you have the place, and you have the dresses. I just thought when I saw this picture for the first time, I saw this cardinal, I thought, oh, Santa is missing a beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you mean Satan is missing his beard. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, but that's just different spelling of the same letters. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just thought that would be interesting to close the tradition part of Lorraine Bettner's book with this, where tradition, the Roman Catholic Church celebrates its victory on a professed Protestant denomination that stands for the Bible and the Bible alone. What, what this, can, I, can I make an analogy here of what this photo is before, before you uh, move it off and go on to other subjects. Let me make a, 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 an analogy of this photograph. Has anybody and everybody ever seen the photograph of uh, the surrender, the, the unconditional surrender of the Japanese Navy, the Japanese government to General Douglas MacArthur on the deck of, of, of the USS Missouri in, in the Japanese harbor? Have you ever seen that photograph? where, where uh, Douglas MacArthur stands like a giant on the deck of that ship and all the delegates of the Japanese are there to sign the documents of surrender. That's what this is. Douglas MacArthur is the one in red and he's signing the articles of surrender from Martin Luther and all the Protestant churches. I'm not over dramatizing this. The significance of what's really taking place in this photograph is never talked about. But now you know. There are no terms of capitulation or negotiation. This is an unconditional surrender. That's what was called for at the Council of Trent. That was de that's what was what was declared as being final at the Second Vatican Council in 1965. And this right here are the signings of those documents, the surrender of Protestantism to the Roman Catholic Church. It's a war. These are spiritual warriors that you're looking at here. One representing the Bible in black, the other representing the Antichrist in red and white. Now do you know how apostate Christianity is today? That's where we are. We've already signed the documents of total surrender, total armistice with the man of sin in Rome. I know that's a bitter pill, but we have to change. We cannot go along with this. And it was shoved down our throats. It was done you know, under the cover of, of pomp and circumstance and religion and celebration 
when in matter of fact, it was the most horrific event in our generation. Possibly even since the day of Pentecost. Back to you, York. I have prepared another picture to end the discussion on tradition. This picture is also taken from another video. Um, it's called The Pagan Origins of Catholic Tradition. And it is taken from an essay on the development of the Christian doctrine by John Henry Cardinal Newman on page 359 of his work. I'm just going to read to you what this says, even though you can read it for yourself, of course. And then we will discuss this a little bit. And Tom has, I think, a lot to say about who John Henry Cardinal Newman was. I have a lot to say on that regard anyway. He says in his essay, quote, the use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tanger, the ring and marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, the ecclesiastical chant and the Kyrie eleison are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the Roman Catholic Church, says John Henry Cardinal Newman, who has been made a saint of the Roman Catholic Church, if I'm not mistaken, in 2021 by Pope Francis, and who is a convert from Protestantism to Roman Catholicism and one of the wickedest Roman Catholics of the 19th century. Please, Tom, your comment. Well, I think it pretty well speaks for itself. Uh, I mean, John Henry Newman, a one-time Protestant, nominal at best, you can assume, joined the Roman Catholic Church and even in the process of doing that admitted that most of the trappings of the Roman Catholic Church, if not all, come directly from paganism. You won't find any of it coming from Christ. You won't find any of it coming from the apostles. You won't find any of it coming from uh, the Hebrews. It's all from paganism, all from the world. And its origins are demonstrable. These are not false accusations. They're not blind accusations. They're, they are researchable truths even acknowledged by the Protestant and evangelical churches that what takes place, the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church are uniquely pagan. They are not Christianity by any stretch of the imagination. Their roots and origins are from the pits of hell. Unrecognizable in the body of Christ. And yet he still converted to Roman Catholicism. And to the degree that the, the once Protestant and evangelical churches of this country are adopting these traditions, they too have departed from the truth. They uh, are partaking in the sins of the Roman Catholic Church and they will surely receive also of her plagues. For her sins and traditions have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered their iniquities. That's what lies in store for the evangelical and Protestant churches that have shunned the truth and made bacon with the whore of Rome. It's a sad, sad day. And I think we're seeing God's judgment, his heavy hand of judgment, even as we speak. 
and there is appears to be, at least from my vantage point, no sign of repentance. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much for your thoughts on this, Tom. I'm glad that we can close this subject in this regard. I just have to look up. I forgot to put up a picture of Gib, book, his book. Uh, I thought I had that here. Understandable. I thought I had the cover of the book. Yeah, I want to show the cover of the book in the oops. In the meantime, of course, while reading that, opening it. Uh, so, in this regard, so we have this here on this side, and opening the PDF. Um, Tom, do you read from the screen or do you have your PDF open on your own computer that you can read along? No, I, I have to read along from the screen here. Okay. It's uh, big enough, I hope? Yes. Okay, because Barely, I, exactly. I can't enlarge it anymore. I can imagine. <laughs> okay. So, this is from Samuel C. Gibbs' book, An Understandable History of the Bible. I started reading that years ago in Hour of the Truth. I uh, never finished it because other things came in between. I would actually like to finish it. And if I ever have the chance uh, with Tom, maybe we go to the beginning of the book because the foreword is the most impressive things I've ever read about understanding the Bible, I can tell you. But here we are speaking about, in Chapter 8, Westcott and Hort. Brooke Foss Westcott, who lived between 1825 and 1903, and Fenton John Anthony Hort, who lived between 1828 and 1892, have been highly, highly controversial figures in biblical history. <laughs> well, I think if I uh, unleash Tom right now, he would say something completely different, but what the author says here, and completely com correct, they have not been controversial figures in biblical history, they have been abominable, ab abominable satanical men in the history of changing biblical history, or the Bible as we know it today. Right, Tom? Yeah, I would just call them servants of Rome and uh, trying to replace the Bible with garbage. I, I don't know how to denounce them any more seriously than that. Yeah. To change God's word, to do away with it altogether, to minimize its importance, to make it unobtainable, uh, to make it so mystical that you can't understand it. Uh, in every way, in every way, destroy the... Uh, the authenticity, the, the, the speech, the meaning, the import of the Bible, God's word, to reduce it to nothing. And uh, that's Westcott and Hort's job from the very beginning. And uh, you have to believe that they were agents of Rome, that they were under Rome's payroll. And uh, they were very successful. And... Uh, there are whole denominations of churches that read their Bibles, Westcott and Hort Bibles. And it's uh, the process of destroying God's word is very mature in our generation. Thanks partly to Westcott and Hort. Back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I just found a picture of the use of the corrupted Alexandrian text in the Bibles that are called the New King James, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the American Standard Version, and the uh, ESV, <laughs> I don't know that name, and the TLB. Yeah? And this is what Westcott and Hort believed and what they put into their works. So, sometimes we just fall short of words to describe men who do these works against our Lord. Anyway, continue what the author says. On one side, their supporters have heralded them as great men of God. <laughs> the question is what God? Not the God of the Bible, I'll tell you. <laughs> Having greatly advanced the search for the original Greek text. On the other side, their opponents have leveled charges of heresy, 
infidelity, apostasy, and many others claiming that they are guilty of wrecking great damage on the true text of Scripture. I have no desire to quote-unquote sling mud or a desire to hide facts. I believe it is essential at this time that we examine what we know, what we know about these men and their theories concerning the text of the Bible. I long sought for copies of the books about their lives. These are the life and letters of Brooke Foss Westcott by his son Arthur and the life and letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort written by his son. After literally months of trying I was able to acquire copies of them both for study. Most of the material in this section will be directly from these sources so as to prevent it from being second hand. We cannot blindly accept the finding of any scholar without investigating what his beliefs are concerning the Bible and its doctrines. Scholarship alone makes for an inadequate and dangerous authority, therefore we are forced to scrutinize these men's lives. A Monumental Switch Westcott and Hort were responsible for the greatest feat in textual criticism. They were responsible for replacing the universal text of the authorized version with the local text of Egypt and the Roman Catholic Church. Both Westcott and Hort were known to have resented the preeminence given to the authorized version and its underlying Greek text. They had been deceived into believing that the Roman Catholic manuscripts, Vaticanus and Aleph, that is, uh, in my understanding, I think Codex Sinaiticus in another name, were better because they were quote-unquote older. This they believed, even though Hort admitted that the Antiochian or universal text was equal in antiquity. Quote, the fundamental text of the late extant Greek manuscripts generally is beyond all question identical with the dominant Antiochian and Greco-Syrian text of the second half of the 4th century." Unquote. Vicious Prejudice In spite of the fact that the readings of the universal text were found to be as old or older, Westcott and Hort still sought to dislodge it from, the, from its place of high standing in biblical history. Hort occasionally let his emotions show, quote, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of text, having read so little Greek text testament and dragged on with the Valenius Textus Receptus. Think of the vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones, unquote. Westcott and Hort built their own Greek text based primarily on a few unical uh, manuscripts of the local text. It has been stated earlier that these perverted manuscripts do not even agree among themselves. The ironic thing is that Westcott and Hort knew this when they formed their text. Bergen exposed Dr. Hort's confession Quote, even Hart had occasion to notice an instance of the Concordia Discourse, unquote, commenting on the four places in Mark's Gospel, namely chapter 14, verse 30, 68, 72, A and B, where the cock's crowing as mentioned said, quote, the confusion of attestation introduced by these several cross currents of, the, of change is so great that of the seven principal messages, and manuscripts Aleph, A, B, C, D, and L, not no two have the same text in all four places. So, in other words, even the scripture that they put at the basis of their study do not agree. A shocking revelation that these men should lend their influence to a family of manuscripts which have a history of attacking and diluting the major doctrines of the Bible should not come as a surprise. Oddly enough, neither men believe that the Bible should be treated any differently than the writings of the lost historians and philosophers. Hort wrote, quote, For ourselves, 
we dare not introduce considerations which could not reasonably be applied to other ancient texts, supposing them to have documentary attestation of equal amount, variety and antiquity. Unquote. He also states that, quote, in the New Testament, as in almost all prose writings which have been much copied, corruptions by interpolation are many times more numerous than corruptions by omission, unquote. We must consider these things for a moment. How can God use men who do not believe that his book is any different than Shakespeare, Plato or Dickens? It's a fundamental belief that the Bible is different from all other writings. Why did these men not believe so? Blatant disbelief. Their skepticism shows, in fact, uh, sorry, their skepticism does, in fact, go even deeper. They have both become famous for being able to deny scriptural truth and still be upheld by fundamental Christianity as biblical authorities. Both Westcott and Hort failed to accept the basic Bible doctrines which we hold so dear and vital to our fundamental faith. Hort denies the reality of Eden, quote, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden, I mean the popular notion, ever existed, and that Adam's fall in no degree differed from the fall of each of his descendants, as Coleridge justly argues. Unquote. Furthermore, he took sides with the apostate authors of Essays and Reviews. Hort writes to Reverend Rowland Williams, October 21st, 1858, quote, Further, I agree with them, meaning the authors of essays and reviews, further, I agree with them in condemning many leading specific doctrines of the popular theology. Evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority and especially the authority of the Bible, unquote. We must also confront Hort's disbelief that the Bible was infallible. Quote, if you make a decided conviction of the absolute infallibility of the New Testament, practically a sine qua non for cooperation, I fear I could not join you. Unquote. And he also stated, quote, As I was writing the last words, a note came from Westcott. He too mentions having had fears, which he now pronounces groundless, on the strength of our last conversation, in which he discovered that I did recognize Providente in biblical writings. Most strongly I recognize it, but I am not prepared to say that it necessarily involves absolute infallibility. So I still await judgment." Unquote. Well, his judgment will come on Judgment Day, right, Tom? Um, that's absolutely right. That's right. Now, his judgment will surely come. And further commented to a colleague, quote, But I am not able to go as far as you in asserting the absolute infallibility of a canonical writing. Unquote. Westcott and Hort strange bedfellows. Yeah. And interestingly, the, the, this information about Westcott and Hort that is so damning came from their own sons. Yeah, their own sons published the private letters these two exchanged. That's where it's found. Uh, th that's what the author said in the beginning. So if they ever meant it to be published, that's another question, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when they are dead, um, you, when you're dead, you don't have any control over what is done with your writings anymore, right? right. <clears throat> so One thing I would like to point out is that uh, certainly we can already see uh, that the attitudes of Westcott and Hort vis-a-vis -vis the scriptures is exactly like that of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why I called them agents of Rome to start with. 
Yeah, strange bedfellows, eh? Westcott and Hort, not yeah. only Westcott with Hort, but also Westcott and Hort with the Roman Catholic Church, eh? Right. <laughs> and bedfellows is, of course, very well chosen because they are in bed with the whore of uh, Babylon. That's right. Though unimpressed with the evangelicals of his day, Hort had great admiration for Charles Darwin. <laughs> As if he wasn't evangelical or Bible-believing well, Christian anyway. Well, 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 look, the listeners might find this this uh, very interesting while we're on this subject of Charles Darwin. <laughs> and for those who don't know, Charles Darwin was the so-called author of the, of the theory of evolution, okay? That man was not created, man evolved from pond scum, okay? Or apes or monkeys and... Uh, yeah, and man is on a journey of, of saving himself through evolution and progress and rising above and transcending our uh, original states, okay? Now, you, you might accept this as just uh, 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 an interesting piece of information regarding Westcott and Hort or either one of them that they, that they admired or at least respected uh what this what this man says about mankind and how he's evolving and one thing and another but you have to also remember that the current pope Francis the first and even before him uh John Paul II allegorized the book of Genesis that it was not uh a record of history that it was uh to be understood allegorically uh, that it it contains uh, valuable information, but not historical information. In other words, it's not to be taken literally. The account of creation is not to be taken literally. And they both supported the idea, that is, Pope John Paul II, or rather Antichrist, Pope John Paul II and Antichrist Francis I, and also Benedict XVI, they all gave credence to evolution and to Charles Darwin. And so you can see even again in this case, there's nothing separating Westcott and Hort from the official belief and teaching of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the man of sin in Rome. There's nothing different about them. All right, back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I was just looking if I had the picture um, because we spoke uh, last week, I think, about the book that I have here from Bill Cooper, which is not the Bill Cooper most people know, the radio host, but uh, is an author of, among the books, The Forging of Codex Sinaiticus, uh, another book that he wrote, The Authenticity of the Book of Genesis. And just because you bring this up, um, that, of course, Darwin, and uh, in this regard now also Westcott and Hort, surely the popes are deniers of the actual um, facts that happened uh, called creation and everything after that, the fall of man, as we just uh, read in this book here also. Um, this is very well studied in the book of uh, Bill Cooper, The Authenticity of the Book of Genesis, where he gives... Uh, perfect accounts of everything happened exactly the way God said it happened and no other way. And that is maybe also a book that you and I will be reading in the future. We are not settled on that yet, but um, it's probably getting very interesting. And also you have to understand, of course, uh, I, I don't even understand how they think that Darwin had anything to do with Christianity. Darwin was a Freemason, high Freemason. His father was a high Freemason. And the basis of the idea of evolution did not even come up with Darwin, who you know, the one who wrote this uh, Origin of the Species book. But that's an idea of his father that he just worked on later on. But anyway, over Darwin, there's so much, any, uh, so much more things to say. I think we should just agree that, uh, and I think Tom agrees with that. He, he said it in other words, um, the spirit of Westcott and Hort is the same spirit that led Charles Darwin. Have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. In spite of difficulties, I'm inclined to think it unanswerable. In any case, 
It is a treat to read such a book. It's a punishment to read something like that, yeah. <laughs> and to John Allerton he writes, quote, But the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. If so, it opens up a new period, unquote. Dr. Hort was also an adherent to the teaching of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. His son writes, quote, In undergraduate days, if not before, he came under the spell of Coleridge. Unquote. Coleridge was the college dropout whose drug addiction is an historical fact. Quote, the opium habit began earlier to deaden the pain of rheumatism, grew stronger. After vainly trying in Malta and Italy to break away from opium, Coleridge came back to England in 1806. Unquote. One of Coleridge's famous works is Aids to Reflection. Quote, its chief aim is to harmonize formal Christianity with Coleridge's variety of transcendental philosophy. <laughs> There's a satanic expression for you. Transcendental philosophy. He also did much to introduce Immanuel Kant and other German philosophers to English readers. All kinds of philosophers, especially Immanuel Kant and Schopenhauer and all the other guys, no Christian whatsoever. This man, Coleridge, had a great influence on the two scholars from Cambridge. Forsaking Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. Hort was also a lover of Greek philosophy. In writing to Mr. A. Macmillan, he said he stated, quote, You seem to make Greek philosophy worthless for those who have received the Christian revelation. To me, though in a hazy way, it seems full of precious truth of which I find nothing and I should be very much astonished and perplexed to find anything in Revelation." Unquote. Lost in the forest. In some cases Hort seemed to wander in the woods. In others he can only be described as utterly lost in the forest. Take for example his views on fundamental biblical Bible truths. Speaking of Hort's devil, Concerning existence of a personal devil, he wrote, quote, The discussion which immediately precedes these four lines naturally leads to another enigma most intimately <clears throat> connected with that of everlasting penalties, namely that of the personality of the devil. Unquote. It was Coleridge who some three years ago first raised any doubts in my mind on the subject, doubts which he never which have never yet been at all set at rest, one way or the other. You yourself are very cautious in your language. Quote, now if there be a devil, he cannot merely bear a corrupted and marred image of God. He must be wholly evil, his name evil, his every energy and act evil. Would it not be a violation of the divine attributes for the word to be actively the support of such a nature as that?" Unquote. Speaking of Hort's hell, Reverend Hort also shrunk from the belief in a literal eternal hell. Quote, I think Maurice's letter to me sufficiently showed that we have no sure knowledge respecting the duration of future punishment, and that the word eternal has a far higher meaning than the merely material one of excessively long duration. Extinction always grates against my mind as something impossible. Unquote. And quote, Certainly in my case it proceeds from no personal dread. When I have been living most godlessly, I have never been able to frighten myself with visions of a distant future, even while I held the doctrine. Unquote. Hort's Purgatory Although the idea of a literal devil and a literal hell found no place in Hort's educated mind, 
educated is of course a questionable word in this regard. He was a very real believer in the fictitious Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. To Reverend John Allerton he wrote in 1854, quote, I agree with you in thinking it a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory, but I fully and unwaveringly agree with him in the three cardinal points of the controversy. First, that eternity is independent of duration. Second, that the power of repentance is not limited to this life. And third, that it is not revealed whether or not all will ultimately repent. The modern denial of the second has, I suppose, more, had more to do with the despiritualizing of theology than, most, than almost anything that could be named." Unquote. Also, while advising a young student, he wrote, quote, The idea of purgation, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us of the divine chastisements, and, though little is directly said resecting the future state, it seems to me incredible that the divine chastisement should in this respect change their character when this visible life is ended." Unquote. I do not hold it contradictory to the article to think that the condemned doctrine has not been wholly injurious, inasmuch as it has kept alive some sort of belief in a great and important truth. Unquote. Thus we see that Dr. Hort's opinions were certainly not inhibited by orthodoxy. Yet his wayward ways do not end here, for as his own writings display, Dr. Hort fell short in several other fundamental areas. Hort's quote-unquote atonement. There was also his rejection of Christ's atoning death for the sins of all mankind. The fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins." Unquote. Now Tom, if I may just interject here a moment, the sentence that we just read, that is just pure Roman Catholic doctrine, right? It certainly is. It certainly is. In the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation. You move from one sacrament to the next to, to gain more and more and more and more grace. But there's no deliverance. Uh, I mean, even after you die, you have to go to pur purgatory to have your sins purged away. In other words, the blood of Christ had no effect, and uh, it's necessary for you to pay for your own sins. You, you remember that Pope Francis said some time ago that Jesus Christ failed even the failure of the cross, right? Yeah. I think this sentence that we just read is just a confirmation of that. Certainly is. And so is it when when Hort said, uh, uh, brought doubt that there was even a, a, a devil, a Satan. Or eternity. Be because if there's no Satan, there's no fall of man. All there is is evolution. Okay? And there's no need, if there if man is not fallen, if man has not fallen, then there's no need to raise him up, is there? There's, there's no need for a savior. And Christ died in vain. You see how subtly they destroy the gospel? If you deny that there's a Satan, then you deny that Adam and Eve were tempted, that they failed, that they fell uh, from uh, their their uh, original state and that death entered into the world through them. And if you deny the first Adam, what use do you have for the second Adam? The entire agenda of Westcott and Hort was to, from a non-Roman Catholic point of view, apparently, to completely enforce Roman Catholicism. Now, you say, now, time out, Tom. You made a mistake here. Uh, they didn't even deny, they even denounced uh, 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 purgatory. 
Rome preaches purgatory. Absolutely, they do, because it's the best money maker they ever came up with. You figure it out now? Rome doesn't care if Westcott and Hort or anybody else condemns purgatory as a lie. As long as people will believe that they must pay for their own sins, purgatory is going to be sold, and they can always reap a tremendous windfall in in money and gold and power and land and riches upon riches by selling indulgences to keep you out of purgatory. Okay? As long as you believe in purgatory, that's all they care. They don't care what Westcott and Hort preaches. They're just covering up one of the greatest cash cows the Roman Catholic Church has ever had. And this is the great beef that Martin Luther had with the Roman Catholic Church, that they used their so-called power of indulgences to keep people out of this horrendous place called purgatory where you have to pay for your own sins. And not only in purgatory, Tom, but this is a plea for the acceptance of... Um, uh, the confession. That's right. I do not yeah. see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the yeah. full penalty for his sins. That yeah. is what he does in the um, uh, in, in, in the chair of um, what's what's the name? I just the said it. of the confession. Yeah, that's what happens in the confession box. Yeah? You yeah. confess your sins to a, another man, a priest, and that priest sentences you to penalty for your sins. Yeah. So Christ is completely out of the picture. Yeah. The failure of the cross, as yep. the Pope says it. I think this is a very, very important sentence we read here. I hope the listeners are getting a clue as to just how much they the, the Roman Catholic Church has nullified the scriptures. And you begin to understand now what importance is placed upon the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church now that the scriptures have been completely obliterated. And you can also understand why a, a Roman Catholic can read his Bible aloud in front of a group of people but he cannot elaborate upon it because the only way he can uh, describe the scriptures that he reads is through the lips, the eyes, and the diabolical heart of his own church. He has to literally regurgitate everything that the Roman Catholic Church has said about the scriptures. He cannot read and understand them for himself. And he most certainly can't articulate any thought about them without the approval of the church. And so the Bible is a forbidden book. And, and, and the best a Roman Catholic can hope to do is to stand up in a, in a crowd of people, read the scriptures, and then sit down and shut up. He certainly can't talk about them. Because he'd run in violation of his own priest. He'd run in violation of his entire church. The Bible is a book of mysteries. Only to be understood and only be to be discussed by the priests. And then only by the so-called unanimous consent of the fathers. Where there was no anonymity at all. There was no unanimity at all. They disagreed on every count. It's a false assertion. It's a blind assertion that there's total agreement in the Roman Catholic Church where there was nothing but controversy at every council, every ecumenical council, every uh, edict from the papacy, the, 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 uh, the, the so-called fathers, uh, were warring against the popes, and the popes were warring against the councils. They disagreed all the time. 
and yet they still promote to the world this uh, this cockamamie idea that there's a complete and total uh, uh, unanimity uh, among the hierarchs of the Roman Catholic Church when there is nothing of the sort. You know, you would expect eventually Satan to contradict himself. Rome makes a practice of it. And now you know why they hate the Bible and why I say that it is nothing short of an obstacle to the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, like, me, the, like the Constitution of the United States is an obstacle for the Roman Catholic Church to fully take yeah, over power in the, right. in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, so, Tom, I, I, I think we've come to the end of the broadcast, but um, I, I think what is uh, very important for the people to understand, and that's why I think it's a good moment to uh, close it down for today and uh, con uh, co continue next week in this reading. Um, the point is that when we know that Westcott and Hort had the belief, at his, as it is written down here and discussed by the both of us for the moment, what people should really understand What is the most important outcome of that is that when you read one of the Bibles that they put out in the market, and I gave you uh, a picture of the different Bibles that you can read, the New King James, the NIV, the ESV, the NASV, and so on and so on, you are led not only by the text of the Bible that is corrupt in the first place, but also by the interpretation of the text. To a completely false belief and you will accept the belief of another Jesus exactly that what Paul warned us and he said when somebody comes and teaches you another Christ than the Christ that I have taught you of that we have taught you here don't believe it and those are the words that I want to end this um, broadcast with on my part And I surely want to give the final conclusion for today on Tom. Well, here's a warning to the listeners. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. They are Catholicizing all the churches without exception. There's no one that, that is exempt from Rome's takeover of the churches. So if not now, soon you will see the, de the, the de emphasis of the scripture and you'll see the promotion of Westcott and Hort or other Roman Catholic Bibles. You will also see an escalation of the hierarchical structure of your church and the authority of those in the hierarchy to dictate what is believed and taught in the church, and the people will be silenced. You'll be allowed to come in, check your brain, your Bible, and your coat at the door, and be like a good little Roman Catholic. Come in, sit down, shut up, and believe and nod and assent to whatever the priest teaches you. And before long, you're going to be told that the Protestants have been just a little bit too hard on Mary. There'll be more and more emphasis on Mary. There'll be talk about purgatory or at least indulgences, indulgences to make atonement for your sins. Okay? There'll be auricular confession or some permutation of confessions. They'll be receiving absolution from your, your, your priestly hierarch for your sins. You're going to see these Roman Catholic traditions first little by little and then by landslides. You're going to see the very things that we've been talking about in this discussion grow flesh and bones in your churches. That's what was accomplished at Vatican Council II in the 1960s. That's what was account, ac accomplished at the capitulation of the Lutherans to the Roman Catholic dele delegation. There you see depicted in this photograph. It's real. It's real time. It's today. It's not future. The Antichrist was revealed a thousand years ago. 1,500 years ago, that man of sin was revealed. It's the Roman Catholic papacy. And if your church is teaching you futurism, he's going to sit you down at this table of capitulation and acknowledge the Pope not as the Antichrist that he is, 
but as the leader of the Christian world. That's what's taking place in your church as we speak. And I want you to know how to see it and recognize it and how to war against it. That's the whole purpose for our meeting. Thanks for listening.